Welcome again to my accounting YouTube channel where I translate technical accounting topics to a storytelling version sort of. So in the past episode, we talked about this, right? So we tried to compute the impairment loss by getting first the present value of the new promised payment of the debtor, which is 4 million. And this 4 million is based on this illustrative problem. Okay? Now we discounted it and we got this 3,217,439. And then we multiplied it with the probability of suffering the loss, which is 100%. And we got the impairment loss. And also we made this entry debit impairment loss and credit loans receivable account. And I said to you that. You have the option of crediting allowance for loan impairment account instead of this loans receivable account. And because of this entry, the receivable was updated from this old amount to this new receivable amount. So we used the new receivable and multiplied it with 1 plus effective rate or 1.115. And then we continued and completed the timeline. We also continued the entries. So we have here the entries for interest income, which is debit, loan receivable, and then credit interest income for two years. And I emphasized again that this debit loan receivable can be substituted with an allowance for impairment losses account if you wanted to. Now, the last entry that we made is debit cash, credit loan receivable for the final payment of BBM for the $4 million. So that's the fast recap. Now. Let me tell you, this computations and recording has a criticism. So what's that? Let's talk about that after this. The biggest criticism for this accounting for impairment is that the computation and measurement and the recording of the impairment loss might be too late already. Because in this problem, in here, we only recognized impairment loss after we saw an objective evidence of impairment, which is, in this case, the filing for bankruptcy of the debtor. So again, it might be too late already, which is why the expected credit loss model was introduced under IFRS 9. And under this model, you can already record and recognize credit losses even without any evidence of impairment. And actually, you can even recognize impairment loss even in the initial recognition date or at the beginning of year one. So, this is the problem. Does it mean that all that we have learned in the past episode became useless? Of course not. Let me tell you why. So, the expected credit loss model has three approaches. However, we're going to focus on the general approach. And in this approach, there are three stages of credit risk or credit loss to be considered. So we have stage 1, stage 2, and stage 3. So the higher the stage, the higher the credit risk is involved. And by the way, credit risk is just the risk that the debtor will not pay. So it's as easy as that. Okay? Now, anyways, stage 3 is the most severe among the three. Now, let's go back to the question. Are all the things that I have told you in the past episode useless? Again, the answer is no. Because the computation that we did and the entries that we did here are all correct and are all appropriate for stage 3 credit risk. Okay? Now, let's have the details. Now, according to the standards, the credit risk belongs to stage 3 already if such credit risk has increased significantly since initial recognition. So that's one of the signs of stage three. Like in this example, let's assume that in the earlier years, like for example, in year one, the credit risk is as if 0% because the debtor is fully capable of paying the principal and the interest payments. I know that this is very unrealistic, but let's assume, okay? Now, from zero credit risk in year one, as you can see, at the end of year two, the credit risk became 100% based on the illustrative problem. And that's a big jump. So we can conclude that the credit risk has really increased significantly since initial recognition in this problem. Now, the second sign for stage three is that 
there is an objective evidence of impairment. Now, that second sign is also present here in the problem. And actually, the evidence of impairment here is the filing for bankruptcy of baby M as the debtor. So, those are the signs of stage 3. So, again, what we did in the past episode, which features this problem and this solution, fits the stage 3 of the general approach of the expected credit loss model. So, it's not useless. What will happen in the accounting measurement and the journal entries if the stage 3 credit risk was reached? So here's what will happen. So first, you have to recognize the lifetime credit losses, which we did already in this solution. So actually this 1,654,917, it's the lifetime credit losses that we are talking about. Okay? And actually, if you define... Lifetime credit losses are the credit losses that the creditor company will suffer in the remaining life of the financial asset. Like in this solution, we computed the impairment losses for the remaining two years. So again, this 1,654,970 can be a perfect example on how to get the lifetime credit losses. Okay? And another... So, there is another effect of stage 3 classification, which is the interest income will be based on the net carrying amount of the receivable or financial asset. Well, how do we get the net carrying amount? So, first, that's gross receivable minus allowance for impairment losses. Now, in this problem, the gross receivable is actually the receivable balance before the impairment loss was considered. Now, how do we get the net carrying amount? Well, that's gross receivable of 4,872,409 minus the allowance for impairment loss of 1,654,970 equals 3,217,439. So that's the net carrying amount, assuming that we use the alternative credit account here, which is crediting the allowance for impairment losses instead of the loans receivable. Okay? Now, let's go back here. According to here, under the stage 3, the interest income is to be based in the net carrying amount. And actually, we followed that in this problem. Because as you can see, the 1.115 was multiplied with the net carrying amount of 3,217,439. Instead of this gross receivable of 4,872,409. So, we can be assured that the interest income that we recorded for year 3, which is this 370,005, it is based on the net carrying amount. Okay? Now, you can check that by multiplying the effective rate of 11.5% or 0.115 times 3,217,439. And I'm super sure that you will get 370,005. So that's stage 3 of the general approach on the expected credit loss model. And again, our previous episode featuring this problem and featuring this solution fits the stage 3. How about stage 2? So stage 2 is less severe than stage 3. And actually, the only sign in stage 2 is that credit risk has increased significantly since initial recognition. So that's the only one. So there's no need for evidence of impairment unlike the stage 3. Now, what will be the accounting effects if you are on stage 2? The effects will be, number 1, you need to recognize lifetime expected credit losses. So this is the same with stage 3. And number 2, the interest income is computed based on the gross carrying amount. So let me emphasize, gross carrying amount. So this is the ones that's different from stage 3. So the interest income here in stage 2, after the impairment is recorded, you need to expect it to be greater. 
Because again, the interest is based on the gross receivable. Okay? So that's it. But for you to really remember and understand, let's assume that the credit risk for this problem that we are solving for is stage 2 instead of stage 3. Okay? Now, question. Will you still get the present value of the new promised payment of 4 million? Answer? Yes, of course. And actually, you will still need to get the difference of this receivable and this new receivable to get the possible lifetime credit losses. Okay? But at this point, I would like to revise a little bit on the probability of 100%. I'm going to make it 80% to make it more realistic for stage 2. Okay? So 100% again was used in the past or in stage 3 because again, we are pretty sure that in the past, BBG will suffer 100% of the impairment loss because again, there is already an objective evidence of impairment which is again the bankruptcy of the debtor BBM. So, in this stage 2 again, let's assume that there is no evidence of impairment. And also, let's assume 80% probability of suffering for credit loss. So, if that's the case, 1,654,917, that will be multiplied already by 0.18. And we will have a final impairment loss of 1,323,976. Now, the journal entry for this is debit impairment loss and credit allowance for impairment. Or, if you want to, credit loans receivable account. So, because of this entry, the net carrying amount of the receivable, it will now become 3,548,433, which is this one this gross receivable minus this one, okay? Now, as to where are we going to multiply the 1.115? Again, according to the standard, the interest income should be based on the gross carrying amount of the financial asset. So we need to multiply it with this one, okay? And if we do that, we will get 5,432,736. And... To get the interest income, we have the difference of this 5,432,736 minus 4,872,409 and we will have 560,327 as our interest income. And our entry for this one is debit loans receivable and credit interest income. And again, you can debit allowance for impairment losses instead of the loans receivable account. So that's the illustration on how to account for stage 2 credit losses. How about stage 1? So stage 1 happens when credit risk has not, so let's emphasize, has not increased significantly since initial recognition. Meaning, the debtor is still performing its obligations quite well. Maybe the debtor is still paying its principal and scheduled interest payments in the due dates. Okay? So in here, the standard states that stage 1 is where there is low credit risk expediency. Or in simple terms, the creditor is conveniently enjoying low risk of non-payment of the debtor. Now, what will happen to the accounting? First is that, you will not recognize lifetime credit losses in stage 1. Instead, you are only to recognize the 12-month expected credit losses only. Okay? Like in this example, you are not to recognize the whole 1,654,970 because this amount is for the credit losses for 2 years until maturity. So what we need to do is let's get the amount for 12 months only. Okay? So let's just assume that out of this 1.6 million plus, 800,000 is considered the 12-month expected credit loss only. Okay? So if that's the case, this 800,000 will be the only credit loss that we are going to consider. And we will make an entry for this, which is debit impairment losses 800,000 and then credit allowance for impairment or loans receivable for the same amount. Okay? So that's it for the application of this here. Now, as to interest income computation after impairment, 
according to the standard, the interest income is to be computed based on the gross carrying amount, which is basically the same with stage 2. Okay? So, we need to multiply this 1.115 with the gross amount of 4,872,409. And if we do that, we will have, again, 5,432,736. Now, again, the difference of these two will be recorded as debit loans receivable or allowance for impairment and then credit interest income for 560,327. Okay? So that's stage one. So at this point, um, we are already through with the stage one, stage two, and stage three of the general approach of the expected credit loss model based on IFRS 9.